Welcome everyone. Um, my name is Hadley German and I'm the Adkins curator here at the, well, not here, <laughs> I'm at home, but at the Fred Jones Junior Museum of Art in Norman. And we're so pleased to have you join us this frosty morning for coffee with the collection. Before we get started, I'm gonna go over a little bit of housekeeping. So all of your microphones should now be muted and we ask you to keep yourselves muted during the program so everyone can hear our presenters without any distractions. If you'd like to make a comment or ask a question, please feel free to do so um, using the chat feature. To open your chat, you can scroll down to the bottom of your Zoom window and click on the icon that has um, a speech bubble. It should also say chat beneath. Once you click on that icon, a window will open on the side of your screen where you can type questions and comments and be sure to hit return. Our presenters will field your questions during the Q&A session at the end of our program. Now it is my pleasure um, to introduce our three special guests today. From the OU Biology Department, we have Dr. Marielle Hoffnagels and Matthew Taylor. Marielle has worked at OU since 1997, the same year she earned her PhD at Oregon State University. She is now a professor and interim chair of microbiology and plant biology. She typically teaches non-majors biology at OU, but regularly teaches scientific writing as well. She is the author of two general biology textbooks published by McGraw-Hill. Matthew Taylor is an adjunct instructor of biology who taught OU's concepts in biology course last fall. He's been helping to write uh, introductory biology textbooks since he graduated from OU a decade ago. Welcome, Marielle and Matthew. And last but certainly not least, we have um, Amanda Bam Garcia today joining the conversation. Amanda received her MFA in printmaking in 2008 from the San Francisco Art Institute, where she was a Fulbright Fellow. In addition to serving as Director of Learning and Engagement at the FRED, Amanda is the fourth district represent representative on the Oklahoma Museum Association Board of Directors and Oklahoma's co-rep on the Mountain Plains Museum Association Education Board. Amanda is also a fine artist and among other interests, a She's a connoisseur of fine pudding, which you're welcome to ask her about later. <laughs> I think it's safe to say that we're all in for a fun and intellectually stimulating morning. <laughs> Sorry, Amanda, when you stop laughing, you can, <laughs> you can take it away. <laughs> Thanks so much, Hadley. Um, <laughs> I'll try to remember my expertise for pudding if there are questions later. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, as someone who usually welcomes everyone to this program, it's interesting being on this side of the coffee table. Um, before I get started, I do want to say a few words about Black Camel Coffee. Um, unfortunately, our friends have had to close their doors this past month, and they will no longer be working with us on this program. It's been an absolute pleasure to have Black Camel Coffee for a partner, and they have always far exceeded our expectations. I want to thank their staff for all of their hard work, dedication, and support for this program. And here at the museum, we wish the Hacker family all the best in their future endeavors. And now to our program. <clears throat> this morning, we're gonna look at a series of 40 photographs titled Nuclear Enchantment by American photographer, Patrick Negatani. And we're gonna look at this work, not just from an artistic perspective, but to talk about how an exhibit of this nature resulted in the collaboration between the museum's education department and two instructors, Dr. Marielle Hoffnagels and Matthew Taylor from the biology department at OU as an example of an innovative approach to teaching from the museum's collection. So first what I'm going to do is give you all a little context to Patrick Nagatani and his series, Nuclear Enchantment. And then we'll dive a little bit deeper into the work through the lens of the class collaboration. I can get to the next slide. Yeah. Uh, Patrick Nagatani was born in Chicago in 1945 um, and raised primarily in Los Angeles, where he grew to be a celebrated artist and educator. In 1987, he moved to Albuquerque to teach at the University of New Mexico. Shortly after arriving in New Mexico, Nagatani began exploring the new landscape he found himself in and was immediately fascinated by the development and continuation of New Mexico's nuclear industry. Nagatani embarked on a four-year journey of intense research and exploration, leading to oftentimes absurdly disturbing discoveries that culminated in a series of 40 photographs titled Nuclear Enchantment. 
<clears throat> in his own words, Nagatani says, quote, my intentions are to raise public consciousness about the effects of New Mexico's nuclear industry that continues to grow despite the damage it has already caused and will continue to bring to the state, end quote. So here we have a map of New Mexico, which the artist has marked with numbers one through 40. Uh, these are 40 various locations around the state that include nuclear testing sites, places of contamination, and nuclear accidents that Nagatani researched and explored that correspond with the images he created also numbered one through 40 in his retelling of New Mexico's nuclear story. By looking at this map, <clears throat> we can begin to understand the artist's obsessively probing detective-like research that went into creating the series of photographs. So I have to share with you all very briefly uh, one of my favorite images from Nuclear Enchantment, not only because it's compelling visually, but also because it's a great example of Nagatani's approach to the creative process. So this image depicts what is known as Trinity Site. Um, at this location, <clears throat> July 16th, 1945, the world's first atomic bomb was detonated, and that's about 60 miles north of the White Sands National Monument. In 1965, about 20 years later, this marker here in the background was erected on ground zero as a monument to the event. One of my favorite aspects of this piece is the absurdity of the image with this tongue-in-cheek kind of feel that catches you right away and pulls you in, but once you get close, you realize what's actually happening in this scene is quite unsettling. And this is a technique that Nagatani uses throughout the series. So here <coughs> in the bottom left corner, uh, we can see this is the artist Patrick Nagatani here. He's wearing a protective suit his wife has made for him, and he, <clears throat> and he almost appears to be disappearing out of view, like he's shrinking, maybe trying to get out of the way of the falling radioactive material. He also is old, oddly holding an umbrella, which reminds me immediately of the umbrella Wiley Coyote holds in his cartoons, just before an enormous anvil is about to crush him an umbrella that could not possibly protect Nagatani or the figure he represents from the nuclear blast at ground zero. <clears throat> Something else that is important to note with this photograph that relates to the entire series is the way it was created. In the background is a photograph Nagatani took at Trinity site. And then he took the photograph back to his studio, painted the sky this dark green and added sort of a sickly radioactive yellow tint to the ground. Um, then the photograph was used as the backdrop <clears throat> behind the scene that he created in front of it. Think of it almost like a set or a large scale diorama um, with himself in the foreground. And he, all of these pieces of foam that were painted green suspended from an apparatus to show the flying Trinitite rock. So Nagatani spent a number of years during the time he lived in Los Angeles working on sets and set design in Hollywood, which informed his artistic practice and is evident throughout nuclear enchantment. So I could go on and on about just this one image, um, but we have a lot more ground to cover. So we'll come back to nuclear enchantment here in just a moment. Um, so what I'd like to do to bring into the conversation our collaboration with OU's biology department and what it was like using this work as a teaching tool. Professor Dr. Marielle Hoffnagers has been a great supporter of the museum for quite some time. Uh, Marielle, you've been bringing your biology students to the museum for years to work on an assignment like this one pictured here. Can you talk a little bit about why you've always tried to incorporate a visit to the museum in your syllabus? Uh, sure, I had a lot of reasons for doing that. One of them is that they, uh, my class is for non-majors, and so I thought they might find it interesting to connect biology to the arts. So I was specifically asking them to look carefully at art and think about the different ways that life and ecological interactions and uh, human impacts on the environment could be depicted in uh, paintings. And so you can see that these are, well, it might be too small for you to see, but basically they're uh, questions that say, go throughout the museum and go find a painting that you think shows major human alterations of the environment and then asks them to describe what they're seeing there. Um, I also use the uh, museum as a 
excuse for not <laughs> organizing larger scale field trips because the weather is always great inside the museum. So we never have to worry about having to cancel a field trip. Um, and it showcases a part of the museum that a lot of students have never gone into. I'm sorry, a part of the campus that a lot of students have never gone into. But as you can see, uh, it's still nothing more than a worksheet from the student's point of view. And uh, so I always thought I could do better, but never really uh, had a great idea for doing that until I reached out to Amanda and she uh, really helped improve our activity greatly, changed it completely and improved it greatly. Absolutely. Yeah, I think if I remember right, you reached out to me after a Coffee with the Collection where I had talked about working with a professor. Um, and I was so happy to hear from you. And what was actually really great about that too is that you reached out to me almost a year before um, you were looking to do anything with your class. So we had so much time to develop what we were going to do. It really made a huge difference. Um, so Marielle, uh, she sent to me her class syllabus and I just sort of kept it in the back of my mind, um, thinking about what was coming up at the museum. And um, so we started talking about our upcoming exhibition, Nuclear Enchantment, and we both got you know, really excited that this could be the perfect body of work to explore a section in the syllabus that talks about um, human impact on ecosystems, and you know, which really aligns with this um, just right. And so we developed the idea to bring the class to the museum. Um, I would lead them through the exhibit for a guided tour and a discussion, and then the students, hopefully thoroughly inspired, <laughs> um, would go out and create their own photographs about an environmental issue that's important to them um, in the style of Patrick Nagatani. And I think it's important to note that the students, unfortunately, only had about a week to complete this assignment, so they did not have much time. Uh, between their museum visit and then uh, when their image was due. Um, and I, I think there was also, they also had to create the image, but then present it to the class and sort of talk about um, the metaphors that they were using and, and what it was they created. Um, so we got super excited about this whole idea. We're like, well, this is gonna be great. And then it almost came to a crashing halt. <laughs> um, but we were saved uh, at the end of the day. Marielle, do you want to explain that a little bit? Well, so we had been working together in uh, last spring, Amanda and I, and then in the summer, the Dean of Arts and Sciences asked me to uh, step in as interim chair of the microbiology and plant biology department. And as a part of that deal, I wasn't going to teach my class after all. And so uh, when that happens, you never know if they're going to cancel the class or if they're going to find somebody else uh, who has no interest in this. And so I, um, well, this was one of many, many reasons why I suggested Matt as the one to take over the class, even though he lives in Tulsa. So <laughs> he did the class remotely and we did the labs in person and it was a uh, pretty uh, unusual arrangement for all of us. But um, Matt then agreed to uh, help take this on, even though he hadn't been involved in the early stages of it, but he was a very good sport about it. Yeah, um, I was I was really grateful to be able to um, get to teach the course. And, um, and I didn't know about this project at all at the time, um, but in all the materials that Marielle handed over to me in July, she said, oh yeah, I should probably reach out to Amanda because she knows something about something that we've been planning for a long time. <laughs> so um, I was like, okay, so what's this about? And uh, we, had a, we had a Zoom meeting in, in August and explains that we have this really cool approach to um, actually have the students create something. Um, so I just want to reiterate that like this is definitely Amanda's and Marielle's idea, but I got the opportunity to kind of implement it in class. Um, and it worked well for what I was hoping to do in class because I was I was hoping to create a class. Um, these are all non-major students, so they don't necessarily love biology. Um, I wanted to create a class that allowed them to um, relate what they learn in class to things that are actually relevant to their life. So medicine, social issues, politics. And I wanted to do as much multimodal learning as I could. So writing and reading, and of course, all of the lectures for video lectures. But here's an opportunity to actually create something as well. So I thought that was a really cool idea. 
Um, so how I set this up in class, well, this, like Amanda said, this is during the, like, the ecology part of the class where we're talking about environmental issues anyway. Um, and we've already talked about things like human population growth, um, habitat destruction, climate change. Um, but I wanted to talk about these important issues, not just um, to highlight that humans are causing all of these problems, but to talk about potential solutions as well. So we talked about all this in the context of sustainability. So, and we define this as not only thinking about the environment, but also thinking about how um, the way that we interact with the world affects people, social issues, and affects the economy as well. And that's, all of this was important to them because we have business majors and um, philosophy majors and psychology majors in there as well. So for this pre for a pre-lab assignment, so before they come to the museum, I wanted to get them thinking about, okay, what do you guys care about in the environment? So I posed this question in this online forum um, for them to think about three issues that are important to them. Um, and, and they came up with some good ideas just even before going to the museum. They talked about um, deforestation, they talked about how this affects not only the environment, but also people, um, environmental issues like water pollution and climate change, carbon emissions. Um, they really thought about these things from a, a comprehensive perspective. And that was exciting to me because like, okay, they're actually kind of going to be invested in this. So this kind of set them up and then they went to the museum to meet Amanda to actually look at this exhibit and I've given them the idea that okay you're going to be looking at all this art and I want you to think about what how can you relate something that you make some kind of art that you make using props and this style um, to an environmental issue that you care about and it can be highlighting that this is a problem or you can be showing uh, a potential solution to it so um, I'll throw it back to Amanda to kind of show you a little bit more of um, the type of art that they were looking at there. <clears throat> Thank you, Matt. Um, I'm so glad that you all spent so much time working on the pre-lab. I think it really made a big difference. You know, the students came in with ideas already um, and they kind of, you provided this foundation that was really important for the kind of discussion we were gonna have in the museum. Um, sometimes when classes come, it's a very different experience when they don't have that sort of uh, basis. So I really appreciated that because that's not something that as museum educators we get very often. <laughs> so it was a nice change. Um, so here you can see are a few photos of the exhibition. And you know, I really have to say the museum staff did quite an amazing job with this exhibit. It's the first time I've ever seen an exhibition title in neon. Uh, which really cast this eerie green glow when you first walked into the gallery that I think Nagatani would have totally appreciated. Um, unfortunately, this exhibition is no longer on view, but you can take a look virtually on our website. Um, I think someone's going to put a link to that in the chat. Um, <clears throat> so what we did is we broke the class up into four different labs. And with each group that came to the museum, I started out by giving them a very brief overview and then allowed the students about 10 minutes to look around on their own. And then I gathered everyone back in the middle of the gallery space um, to have the discussion. And, and here you can see by the fourth lab, I ended up on the floor. I'm glad everybody else did too. <laughs> it, it was a lot. <laughs> but uh, because the students were going to be creating their own photographs and knowing that you know none of them were art students and, and I figured had a very limited art background, it was important to me that we talk not just about nuclear enchantment, but also about the role of artists as activists, um, especially when looking at social political work like Patrick Negatani's. And to also talk about the concept of visual art as a powerful form of communication. So that led us right into a discussion about the different strategies uh, Patrick Nagatani used so effectively in his own visual language that would give the students kind of a guideline and a structure that they could follow in order to create their own images. So one of the first aspects we talked about um, is the artist's use of color as a way to create an emotive response in the viewer. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Many students commented on the overwhelming use of red that they felt gave a sense of danger and heat and intensity. And then the image on the left, um, the figure seemed to be almost enveloped by this overwhelming 
red sky, and it even gives their skin sort of a sunburned appearance. Um, and at least one person in every lab group also commented on the coloration of this like leaking toxic gases that uh, you could see in numerous images. So here in the one on the right, we have these blue vapors that are escaping from a small marker that indicates the location of an underground nuclear test, uh, signifying to the viewer the toxicity of the air that seems to be adversely affecting, affecting the individual whose blue hands appear there. Um, in the foreground. So just as we talked about the overwhelming saturation of color that can stimulate an intense reaction, you know, conversely, the absence of color can also have quite an impact. So we talked about how this piece in particular, um, Nagatani creates an entirely different kind of mood that is much more somber. Um, it's quieter with this dark umber color throughout that makes it primarily monochromatic. Um, it's not just the lack of color in this image, but also the extreme use of light and dark. You know, there's this enormous black swath that kind of like takes up two thirds of the entire scene. And the only light is this bright highlight far off in the distance that Nagatani, that's who's pictured here, and his son um, are looking towards. And again, a completely different feel from the previous two images. So aside from talking about different colorations and the possibility of heightening the contrast between light and dark, we also talked about three different examples of types of locations they could use to create their own images. So the first was a landscape um, <clears throat> to go out into their environment and explore what was around them. So in this example, we're shown one photograph, the reality of the Navajo homes near Shiprock um, with a desolate horizon of uranium tailings covering everything and radioactive dust. The sky is painted this brick red uh, in contrast to the white tailings. And superimposed on this scene is a fold-out image of shiprock with blue skies, suggesting the loss of the land as it once was. We also talked about utilizing an interior space. Um, this is another one of my favorite images, just I think in the strangeness with all the jello boxes. Uh, like a detective, <clears throat> Nagatani tracked down the address of Russian spy David Greenglass and set up the scene in Greenglass's old apartment. Nagatani had read accounts about two matching parts of a jello box that fellow spy Harry Gold used to make contact with Greenglass in their campaign to pass along nuclear secrets. Students commented on the banality of the scene uh, through its lack of color. And in this last example, we talked about what was the possibility to create an entirely constructed scene, much like a diorama if they chose. With this image, we also went over the basics of foreground, middle ground, and background. Um, in the foreground, we have all the model pieces Nagatani painstakingly built and hand painted. Uh, the middle ground, we have the runway, and in the background is Kirtland Air Force Base. So we talked about the importance of making decisions when taking their own photos that would take all three of these pictorial spaces into consideration. Um, and exaggerating the foreground space is something Nagatani frequently did with his work. So we talked about that quite a bit. Um, and another interesting note, you know, I mentioned earlier that the students only had a week to create their image. And in contrast to that, <coughs> um, this image I think took Nagatani uh, I believe it was six months to create uh, because he was trying to find in hobby shops the exact decals and just the right um, details for all of the, the models. So things were not you know, made up or embellished on his own. Um, so we talked about knowing that they didn't have quite that amount of time. <laughs> um, so it, it was interesting. Um, <clears throat> so let's see. And then in the exhibition, we also had a hands-on section for visitors to be able to build their own scene and take a photograph. The students were invited to utilize this area if they chose to, but the only caveat was that they had to bring their own elements to set up on the stage. They were not allowed to use the generic pieces uh, that we already had available. So interestingly, only one student elected to use the staging area in the museum. Um, so usually at the end of our, our conversation uh, for these four labs would end in this space, at least on my end, and then I would hand things over to Marielle and the TAs um, who stepped in to sort of 
wrap up the conversation and kind of bring it full circle back to what the students were then um, tasked with doing. Marielle, do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, um, so we all gathered here at sort of the end and uh, <laughs> I had to introduce myself because remember I was not teaching this class, but I was this kind of weird old lady that was following them around, watching them look at the art and just kind of lurking about. And uh, so I <clears throat> told them that I was the one who they would have known by then if I had been teaching the class as planned, but that I had helped to uh, create this activity and that I was so excited about it. I just could not watch as it, as it uh, went into practice. And so uh, with that bit of introduction, I asked, I, I wasn't sure uh, how comfortable the students were with this assignment because we'd never tried it before or tried anything like it before. So I just asked, uh, you know, did they, how many of you have an idea of the kind of thing that you want to create? And I was really surprised by how many of the students raised their hands and were, had after, like they didn't really understand what it was gonna be until they saw the exhibit. And then once they saw the exhibit, they had an idea of the kind of thing they wanted to create. And so I just asked, uh, okay, what do you think you want? What do you think you, I just asked people to volunteer what they thought their subject was gonna be. And so then one of them would say deforestation and one of them would say, climate change, and one of them would say uh, habitat destruction, and one of them would say water pollution. And I got the sense that there were only really a handful of students who, by the end of this tour, were still a little bit lost about the, what they wanted to do. So between the pre-lab and the um, museum tour, I think they felt pretty inspired to uh, create what they needed to create. You know, I remember that was something we talked about a lot, is knowing that these students are not art students and being concerned that they would feel intimidated or you know, unsure of how to actually make an art piece themselves. And we were worried that you know, after looking at Patrick Nagatani's, is someone gonna think, oh, I can't make an image like that. Like, that's amazing. Um, but I think because we were so concerned about it, the way we ended up presenting it and with the pre-lab and all of that, it ended up making it pretty accessible, I feel like. I, I didn't get the sense that anyone was you know, really nervous <laughs> about um, actually creating something. Well, and we were, remember, we were very careful not to call it a piece of art, that we were very careful to call it an image and not art, because I think if it had been me and somebody said, create some art, I would be like, nope. <laughs> but if it's taking a picture of something, yeah, I can do that. I do that all the time. So uh, we, we actually did a search throughout all the materials and made sure that we expunged the word art from anything except the name of the museum. <laughs> That's, that's something I'm going to have to keep in mind. <laughs> <over there. laughs> um, so let's take a look at uh, what we have a few examples of um, what some of the students put together, which I think are really, really amazing. So here we have a student, Asher Felty, on the left. So he talks about um, he used the globe as a literal representation of the earth and the ice at the base to represent the melting of the polar ice caps. Um, and so he, he says he uses fire as a metaphor um, for humans causing wildfires, which makes up 97% of the fires that threaten homes. And he, um, he, he set up the scene out at Lake Thunderbird because he said he wanted to have sort of this pristine looking environment behind him um, with this sort of destruction in the foreground, which I think is a fascinating, uh, amazing, you know, he really captured that from Nagatani and, and remembered what we had talked about, what he had seen. And it was interesting when he was talking in the class presentation, um, <laughs> it was kind of funny. He had doused this globe with so much lighter fluid to get it to actually catch fire long enough to take a photo. <laughs> um, we were all laughing about how environmentally unfriendly that actually ended up being, <laughs> um, but it was, uh, it was a great experience. Um, and then we have Maggie Contos on uh, the right here. She talks about her photo representing the environmental issue of deforestation from greenhouse gases caused by carbon emissions. So she has a black and white photo um, in the background, which represents the depletion of air quality from cars that you can see in this parking lot. And so she really heightened the green of the plant 
um, to represent sort of this means of restoring uh, the environment through plants and the necessity to plant um, more trees to increase the air quality. And so she did that by playing with the saturation of color, which is again, something else that we talked about with Nagatani's work. Um, and with these, as you can also tell too, they were really taking advantage of that sort of uh, exaggeration of the foreground space, which is definitely a Nagatani trick. So I'm, I'm glad that they remembered that. And then we also have these here. So we have Ellie Lamaster on the left, um, and she talks about water pollution. And so this is a photograph she took in a water runoff in a Norman neighborhood. And so she was thinking about water pollution and how it affects sort of everything. And so she put this um, water inside a drinking glass to make us think that, you know, this is water that we are also drinking and that also affects the wildlife around us. Um, and again, she's using this foreground space. But what I think is really great uh, is compositionally, this photograph is amazing because she's got, everything sort of converges into this point right here in the back. We've got the, the runoff that sort of like, you know, comes at this angle and then even the, the sides of the, um, oh, my cursor will work. And the hills that sort of just kind of all come down to the same area, which I think is fascinating. Whether or not she attended that, it worked fantastically. Um, and then we have Jack Harpool over on the right side. And so his image, he talks about the overpopulation of cattle um, for the meat industry and the methane gas that's then released into the air. And so he's got here this really great, uh, obviously emotive use of color. This looks like a sky that you would find in any of Nagatani's photographs. Um, and so he's sort of thinking about it as a, the future, like a look into the future if we don't do something about this issue now, um, which is also something that Nagatani thought about as well. And we talked about in the exhibition was sort of the now and then the what does this hold for the future. So we have uh, Madison McCall here on the left, and she talks about uh, plastic pollution. And so she says this is a photograph she took in Galveston, Texas. Uh, where she talked about seeing a lot of plastics um, in the water as well as on the beach area. And so <laughs> she, I really love this like rainbow with the recycling can at the end. It's sort of a very tongue in cheek. It's a little Nagatani, you know, kind of joke um, out in the middle of the water. And so it, it kind of makes you chuckle at first, but then when you look at it a little deeper, you see that giant trash pile on the sand. Um, and so it has that same effect um, and she talks about adding the children in the foreground as this idea to make us think that, you know, this is happening now, but this is also going to affect future generations. So I thought it was really great that all of them were thinking about um, into the future as well and how important that is. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, and then we have Elizabeth Daly on the right. Um, she's talking about deforestation. And so she says that uh, her boyfriend is an arborist, and so she went with him and took some photos as he was cutting down trees. And I didn't notice it. I've looked at this image numerous times, and I didn't see it until yesterday. This is her boyfriend perched on top of this um, tree that he's cut down. And I, anyway, I just thought it was a part of the tree for a very long time. <laughs> um, but it's amazing to see uh, this figure here. And so, she talks about um, playing with the contrast and, and the color, and she really wanted the color to convey a lot of the sadness that she said she felt while she was out there with him and watching him cut down these trees. Um, and then we have here in the foreground, um, this is, I believe, her younger brother and maybe someone else in her family, and they're watching the movie The Lorax, and she's cut them out and placed them in this scene um, with all of these trees that have been um, cut down. Again, also thinking about future generations and how they're going to have to deal with these issues as well. Um, so those are just a few examples. And then <laughs> um, this is the first time I've ever been involved in an assignment where the instructors and I were asked to take part as well. <laughs> so uh, that made me think this is probably a, a pretty successful thing. Um, so we all made our own images too. Do you guys, Matthew, do you want to start? Do you want to tell everyone what yours is about? Sure, yeah, I'm, I'm so excited to get to um, show off my artistic abilities with you. Um, 
I, I, my photo here is uh, I'm shaking out this um, polyester blanket um, and it's showing how um, synthetic fibers like polyester are, are made of plastics. And um, it's kind of just showing how we unwittingly put plastics into our water supply. So you wash a polyester blanket, then little plastic um, fragments end up washing out and ending up in the the nearby streams and such as well. Um, and that has impacts on um, the ecosystem as well. So this is just a way of showing like how we don't really understand even some of the impacts that we're having on the environment. Ariel, do you wanna go next? Sure, so um, I took my picture while I walked along the Legacy Trail from Acres to Duffy. And I took a picture of every plastic piece of trash that I saw. And then I picked it up and threw it away just so I didn't just leave it there. <laughs> and my original idea had been to take that, uh, in the middle you see that plastic that's shaped into an infinity that was one of those holders for a six pack. And I had meant to put all these pieces of plastic in the shape of the infinity symbol, but it, it didn't work, it looked stupid. So my next idea <laughs> was to just take the pictures, crop them, or uh, yeah, not crop them, but uh, take away all the backgrounds, and then I shape them into the word legacy with the not so subtle idea that all this plastic pollution that we're creating is a legacy that we're leaving for the future, plus it's legacy trail. And then that purple background is, uh, I don't know if you've seen, those of you who live in Norman, uh, that the some of the big storm drains or the little storm drains, they um, contracted people to make only rain down the drain um, paintings around them. And so this is one that's in one of the big old culverts uh, along the Legacy Trail. And the, it's sort of like swirling down the drain and it's saying only rain down the drain. And so it's a reminder that all this plastic ends up in the water as well, similar to Matt's idea. Yeah. It's interesting. We all kind of did this similar. So mine is also about plastic pollution. <laughs> I can see what's on our brains. Um, so I, I was thinking a lot about, you know, as, as a, in museum education, we do a lot of um, events and, and we go out to a lot of places and we bring supplies. And a lot of times we end up using these um, condiment cups and, you know, they're one time use throw away kind of thing. And as we were actually working on this project, I think I was putting together a kit to take somewhere and I thought, hmm, <laughs> there's gotta be a better thing that I can be using than this that's going to end up um, in the trash, which then you know ends up in a landfill. So my original idea was to try to build this giant tower um, on, on our education space on that um, sort of stage that we had. And I just wanted to make this huge tower of condiment cups and they kept falling down and, and other staff members were looking at me like I was crazy. <laughs> Wing. <laughs> so, so this was my um, second solution, um, and I just uh, put some plastic plant life um, inside these condiment cups to hopefully say the same thing. I don't think it really does, but it gets close. <laughs> um, so I'm going to go ahead and skip forward. Uh, so now if you all would like to, we do have a Google site that we made that has all of the student images so you can see all of them, which you know, unfortunately we didn't get a chance to show you all today. And they are quite amazing, just like the examples we showed. Um, there's gonna be a link to that in the chat and I'll also include that link when I send out the recording to everyone. Um, but you can go to that Google site and as you can see with Adriana's here, if you click, there's this little, um, down arrow here. If you click that arrow, their written descriptions will pop up that will tell you more about um, what they were thinking and what their image is all about. Um, so I highly encourage you all to look at those. Um, I think that kind of wraps up our discussion. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen. Um, so we're kind of at the, the Q&A portion now. Um, and I'd like to invite anyone who has any questions um, for any of us, please go ahead and, and put those in the chat. But while you all are thinking of those, Marielle and Matthew, I have a question for you. Um, sure. You know, you all came to the exhibition and looked around at the work uh, before we brought the class in. And I was just kind of curious, 
what your thoughts were just as biologists, um, not really as instructors necessarily thinking about this class, but what did you think when you first saw um, Nagatani's images? What were your first impressions? You first, Mario. Um, honestly, I thought about my dad because this was one of the issues that he cared so, so much about for many decades uh, that the whole nuclear industry, he's been, he had been protesting it since at least the 80s, if not earlier, and it was very near and dear to his heart. So to uh, be able to work on this had sort of a special uh, personal connection as well. I just thought it was, it's just incredible how manipulating photographs of rather ordinary things can make the message so powerful. And so that was one of the things that I enjoyed about it. I've, I've, in working on this, I probably saw the exhibition about 10 times and every time was just struck by the power of photography for making a statement about something that's important to the individual creating the image. Yeah, I mean, Mario said things, a lot of the same ideas that I had when I was there. Um, I was trying to figure out at the time how I was going to pitch this to the class um, because they hadn't seen it yet. Um, and what I ended up taking away from it is that um, he really captured how um, the human pursuit of, of control and, and strength actually affects not only the environment, but the people around it as well. Um, and I felt like that went pretty well with what I was trying to explain about what sustainability means. So we have to think about things from a lot of different perspectives. Um, and I think he captured that well. And students love messing with photos. So I knew once I actually saw what these look like that students were going to enjoy um, making these images. I'm going, I'm going to come back and um, ask you guys some questions that have been put in the chat, if you don't mind. Um, but first of all, before I do that, I wanted to um, agree with Catherine, who commented that Asher's image is fabulous. And I, I agree, Catherine, when I first saw that, I thought that that was, um, you know, it, it could have a place on a museum wall, just, you know, just like Nagatani's. I thought that was fantastic. Um, okay, well, Doug Gaffin has asked, he said, fantastic job all. This is such a great way to have OU classes interact with the museum. And do you have suggestions for collaborations with other, with various disciplines? Email me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, that's the short answer. <laughs> um, um, no, I, uh, the really great thing about working in the museum and working with visual art is it's so interdisciplinary. Like, I really feel like there's anything we can do with anybody at any time. Um, really, the key is, I think, having enough time to figure out what that is. So it was really great that Marielle, I, I think it really was maybe, it was more than six months ahead of time that um, she reached out to me. So if you do want to work together in the future, you know, summer is a great time to say, hey, I've got this class coming up. I'm not really sure what to do and share your syllabus with me. And then you know, we can put our heads together because like I have one half of the piece of the puzzle, you have the other half and somehow we got to meet in the middle. <laughs> so uh, usually it takes a little brainstorming to get there, but um, I'd, I'd love to work with anyone on campus. So please feel free to email me. May I suggest that if I were teaching chemistry, which I am not, that I would totally do something with the art museum because so much of art has to do with chemistry in so many different ways with acids and pigments and oils and you know so much of kind of the applications of organic chemistry and inorganic chemistry can be depicted in art so I would I think that would be so much fun. Amanda do you want it um, it's kind of early to talk about it maybe but we are hoping to collaborate in the fall with the exhibition of um, of Robert Rauschenberg's prints that are, it's called Currents, and the series deals with um, contemporary um, headlines from the late 1970s. And that's something I think that we could definitely um, involve other departments with. Yeah, absolutely. We've talked about um, since their newspaper headlines that Rauschenberg was looking at and making collages out of, we thought how fantastic it would be to work with the School of Journalism um, and we could talk about, you know, print news today, but even beyond print news, just this idea of just information as it comes out in the news. And, you know, it's 
very topical, I think, even though what Rauschenberg did was very um, specific to 1970, I think there's some bigger ideas in there that we can pull out that are relevant definitely today. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, Claire has asked if there were any follow-up exercises to see how or if this project changed the student's view um, or views of these issues. Well, um, Marielle and I put together a, um, a post survey. So um, since this is the first time that we did the assignment, we wanted to know the same thing. So did students enjoy this? Did they get anything out of it? Um, one uh, easy piece of data to share is that uh, we didn't force them, of course, to put their images at the museum. Uh, we asked if they um, were willing to share their images and three out of four, 75% of them um, said that they would love for their images to be shared with the museum collection. So um, that's just a testament to how much they really um, put effort into and um, were proud of uh, the images that they made. Um, but then also we asked questions like, um, what, what did you learn? What was your favorite part? Um, what was your favorite part was, was spread all across the board. Some people loved making the images. Some people loved being at the museum. Some people really liked the presentations at the end. So we had them all present their images to the class and, um, and talk about the envir environmental issues um, and how they made the art as well. But then what was the most important thing that you learned? People talked about um, things like, uh how anything can be considered art and i thought that was super cool um a lot of people said things about how well just like art has this this amazing power to let people see things from different perspective and i thought that was that was neat and then some people um said things like don't mess with mother nature and i thought that was kind of funny so um it was all across the board i feel like it really helped people to not only appreciate art but also look at um human impacts on the environment in a different way um and catherine had added she was glad to see this interaction of departments um at ou and she um, comments that jim dine's artwork rapidly advanced rapidly at the University of Florida because he was able to go, for instance, to the chemistry department to develop a certain color. Um, yeah, that's really interesting um, and something maybe we can consider looking at with our own <laughs> gym time oh collection. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to keep that one in mind <laughs> for sure. <laughs> Well, I'd encourage anyone, if you have um, additional questions you'd like to post in the in the chat, please feel free to do so. And also, I wanted to remind everyone that if you didn't get a chance to see the exhibit since it's closed, it um, it is. There is a link in the chat that, that Karen posted at the very top of the chat. Um, um, I do see a question from Leslie. I don't want to leave it unanswered because Leslie, we we love your participation and support. So I feel like, <laughs> okay, so you're asking about my pudding experience. <laughs> it's an internal joke that we have at the museum. We like to pretend we are fine connoisseurs of pudding. We just have jello pudding in my office and whenever anybody needs a snack or we need a break or like a to decompress, it's pudding time. <laughs> so that's basically all that is. <laughs> yeah, it sounds much more exciting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, well, if there aren't any additional questions, I guess I'll, I'll let Marielle and Matt, Matt um, if there's anything else you wanted to share with the group before we sign off, um, please take this moment. I, I mean, yeah. I just want to say thank you to Amanda. I didn't know what I was, you know, I, I saw this coffee with the collection and I thought I would just take a flying leap and see if this Amanda person was as nice as she seemed like she was going to be from the coffee with the collection. And, and she's just been such an incredibly positive uh, influence on, uh, on this project. And I want to say thanks to Matt for being such a good sport about uh, not doing the easy thing and also sort of taking a flying leap on a new activity. I had a lot of fun with it and I can tell the students did too. So yay that we all um, actually pulled it off. Absolutely. I can't think of two better people to have worked with on this project. And Matthew, really, you really did save the day. We were heartbroken that this might not actually happen. <laughs> and then, and you just took off. 
worked on it even more and embrace it and didn't think that we were uh, totally crazy. <laughs> so I really appreciate that. And Marielle, you've been just fantastic. I can't wait to continue working with you in the future. So thank you so much for reaching out to me. And we should also um, give a shout out to Marielle because she's going to be presenting this work at a conference, I understand, in the summer, right? Or Yes, at the uh, Association for Biology Laboratory Education at uh, in Victoria, BC. So international audience. <laughs> and they're actually going to, it's a, hand, a hands-on workshop. So they're gonna, in the space of an hour or so, are gonna take a shot at creating their own image. We'll see if that works in that kind of a compressed time period, but it should be fun. I think we'll all look forward to hearing from you how that goes, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Can I ask a quick question? Go ahead, Tamako. I'm sorry, I tried to send the chat message and somehow it didn't go. So <laughs> I ap apologize for just intruding. Anyway, um, so uh, use of the exhibit, my husband teaches history of science. In this semester, early this semester, he gave an assignment to students to go look at this exhibit. And the segment uh, they were dealing with at that time was why or well, why not trust science? So they into the nuclear issues. Um, <clears throat> another comment is uh, those student images are fantastic, very interesting, but more focused on the environment rather than the people. Mm -hmm. I thought maybe you could have <clears throat> somebody could have talked about uh, Native Americans or Japanese or Japanese Americans uh, element that may have been interesting. Uh, I'm not really criticizing anything. Uh, it's a bad idea to criticize what's missing. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> uh, another comment is, has anyone heard, listened to um, the NPR program last year about Trinity site? A number of uh, young, um, maybe Amanda can send the link to everybody if interested. Um, there was a, a dance camp near the site and these teenage girls were without knowing what was happening. And oh, all these um, the uh, white flakes, you know, from the fallout. They saw snow in the middle of the summer, mm -hmm. and then they were just dust around um, in the fallout. And of course, uh, uh, only one person survived more uh, longer than age thirty of the girls who were at the camp. And this story was written in uh, what National Geographic, and the uh, NPR interviewed uh, last fall. Anyway, it, it's a very scary story, and it could have produced a very interesting, effective image too. Anyway, sorry about the long comments. Oh, no, it's fine. Tomoko, send me that link, and I'll, I'll send that out to everybody. Okay. You know that to okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, if there aren't any other questions or comments, I will um, thank all of our presenters, Amanda and Marielle and um, Matthew for joining us today. That was really fascinating and I, it was a real treat to hear you all um, talk about this project and the relationship to Nagatani's images, which I think was an exhibition we were all um, quite um, happy to have. And I should, I should mention that that uh, body of work was a gift to the museum from the Museum Association. Um, as a result of not having, um, the Museum Association generally pays for uh, openings, museum openings, and since we had no openings in 2020, no celebrations, um, they chose to give us uh, an artwork. And so that, that is one of the most recent acquisitions in the museum's collection, those 40 images by Patrick Nagatani. Um, okay, well, thank you all of you for joining us today for Coffee with the Collection, and I want to invite you to mark your calendars for the next Coffee with the Collection canine edition, which will be held on Friday, May 20th at 9.30 a.m. It is going to be a howling good time. We'll have special guest Courtney Hoffman, who is an assistant professor of anthropology at OU, who researches human wildlife interactions. And she's going to be discussing artwork in the museum's collection that features canines. So you can bring your coffee, your dogs, your cats, your birds, and join us on May 20th. 
There's a link to register in the chat window, and you can also find the link um, if you go to our uh, events page on our website. Until then, we thank all of you for joining us, and we hope you stay warm, stay safe this weekend, and have a, have a really creative weekend. Thank you.